This is the story of the widow's mite, a cautionary tale in three parts. Part one, the widow's mite, or what exactly are we talking about here? My grandmother would have used the word mite like this. That skirt is a mite too short. <laughs> or that custard is a mite too sweet. And we would all have understood that she meant whatever it was, it was a little too something. A little too this, a little too that, too small, too big, too long, too short, too sweet. I'm guessing that a few of us use that expression anymore, although I told the 9 o'clock service that I may have to resurrect it just for Tom's amusement. He, he enjoys my 19th century vocabulary. <laughs> Maybe the only other time we hear that word, we think about those creepy little bugs, dust mites, which we hope are not hiding under our beds. But in the context of this scripture passage, we all understand the word mite to mean money, and not very much of it. Probably the least amount of money a person could have, the smallest, most worthless coin in anybody's pocket. In the first century, there was an amazing variety of coinage in common use. There were locally minted bronze coins in the cities of Caesarea and Ascalon. There were coins from Phoenicia brought in through trade routes, copper and silver coins from Rome brought in through troop movements and commerce, and the imperial coinage of the region minted in Antiochia. Of these, the denomination of the bronze coins is the most difficult to determine because it wasn't imprinted on any of them. The small coin mentioned in today's gospel was most likely a lepton, translated in the King James Version of the Bible as a mite. For better understanding, translators used the names of small contemporary coins, so the King James Version reads, two mites, which make a farthing. And the Revised Standard Version says, two copper coins, which make a penny, which is essentially how we heard it this morning. Either way, it's meant to indicate the lowest and smallest denomination of coinage in circulation at that time. And it has become one of the ways that we have traditionally interpreted the story of the widow's mite. Recalling the story, we remind ourselves of how the value of even the smallest gift is increased when the small gifts are added together. 100 pennies in a piggy bank to make a dollar. A weekly quarter in the offering plate at Sunday school that adds up to a donation to the Heifer Project. Loose change collected every night in a jar towards a special trip that will add up eventually to perhaps even a hundred dollars. All ways that we learn to appreciate the value of even the smallest coin. Now reading this scripture passage, I am reminded of the least coin offering that has become so much a part of women's organizations in churches throughout the world. If you're not familiar with it, it began in the mid-1950s, shortly after the war when a group of seven women from different countries traveled to Asia. They were inspired by their experience there to begin a prayer ministry that would promote reconciliation and peace and justice. It was a project that every woman could participate in, no matter what her economic circumstance. It was very simple. Every time a woman prayed, she was to set aside the least coin of her currency as an expression of her solidarity with those who suffered. It is now a worldwide organization, the International Committee of the Fellowship of the Least Coin. They disperse funds annually, block grants to each representative region, grants to projects and programs that meet certain criteria, and emergency grants for disaster relief. The Least Coin is a symbol of prayer for peace and a very tangible expression of ecumenical stewardship, one small coin at a time. Writing in last week's Christian Century, Heidi Newmark, who is the pastor at an inner city church in New York City, recalled a visit to a Roman Catholic parish in one of the poorest areas of Mexico City. She tells about arriving just as the benches and the plastic chairs were set up outside around a makeshift altar as people gathered for early mass. When it came time for the offering, people got in line, many of them carrying what appeared to be a small plastic bag filled with rice. Each one of them stepped forward and poured the contents of their bag into cans that were set up on the altar until all of the cans were filled to the brim. Afterwards, the priest explained that every day, 
every family takes at least one spoonful of rice and puts it aside. He noted that it doesn't add to anybody's hunger, but it does make a difference for those who receive the donation of rice, usually a household where there is an illness or a death in the family. Newmark writes, the practice of setting aside spoonfuls of rice wove giving into everybody's daily routine. Your neighbor's daily bread was part of your own, something you remembered each time you cooked or even picked up a spoon. It made a difference because it was a pattern embraced by the whole community, connecting their communion around the altar to the tables in their neighbor's homes, one small grain of rice at a time. Part two, the widow's might, or the somewhat questionable power of her witness. Another way that we have traditionally interpreted this text is to hold up this poor woman as a paragon of virtuous giving, the gold standard for trusting that God will provide. Look, she has given all that she had. Surely you can dig a little deeper this year, which quite frankly is a terrible way to talk about stewardship and giving. But indeed, the gospel lesson has been invoked time and again to remind us to give, and then to give a little more. Perhaps like me, some of you have been up in the middle of the night flipping through channels and have had the dubious fortune to come upon what one of the televangelists preaching what has become known as the prosperity gospel, which in a nutshell says that God blesses those whom God favors with everything from healing to material wealth to salvation. Those of us who are old enough remember Oral Roberts and will recall that in 1987 he told his flock that God would call him home if he didn't raise $8 million in a matter of weeks. And the money rolled in. And Oral Roberts died in 2009 at the ripe old age of 91. His empire is now in the hands of his son Robert, who every day tells his followers to expect a miracle, which wouldn't be bad advice if it didn't come with some monetary strings attached. The past decade or so has seen the rise of the prosperity gospel in more mainstream circles, particularly with the ministry of Joel Osteen, who not that long ago wrote to his faithful following saying, God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny that he has laid out for us. Which again sounds wonderful and would be if it didn't prey on the emotions and the desperate need of those who can least afford it. Give all that you have even when you don't have it to give. Remember that poor widow in the gospel who gave all she had to live on. Hopefully very few churches distort the gospel this way. But when stewardship season rolls around, let's be honest, we do encourage and certainly hope for increased giving so that the church can do more than simply survive the economics that we're all living with. But here's the bottom line. Of course the church needs money. We all know that. But the church should never be a financial hardship on anyone when there are others who can give more and when there are dozens of ways that you can give to the church that don't involve money. I wish all of you could see what goes on behind the scenes around here in terms of giving of time and energy and enthusiasm, which is simply immeasurable and which we could not do without. As part of the mission and ministry of this church, we made the decision to make the building available for community use. And the result is a wonderfully full and vibrant church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or it feels like that. The other result is it also gives enormous wear and tear on this building and it isn't getting any younger. I sometimes imagine that it feels like I do after baby gymnastics class with the two-year-old. <laughs> we set aside a day a couple of times a year as work day or cleanup day, but you would be amazed at the number of people who are here every day caring for this church volunteering in the office, working in the garden, repairing broken lights, painting damaged walls, picking up trash around the building. Part three, widow's might. Or what else might the widow have to teach us? And for that we need to go back to the prologue to this story, back to the first part of the scripture lesson where Jesus says, beware of the scribes, they devour widows' houses. Remember a few weeks ago I talked about the incredible financial hardship that divorce placed on women in the first century who were left with no means of support if they weren't taken back by their families, specifically their father. Becoming a widow didn't automatically mean that a woman would become impoverished. 
Widows, orphans, and strangers, you remember, are often mentioned as deserving extra care. But the absence of a husband made a woman much more vulnerable to the possibility of being forced into debt more easily by the legal and the economic system of which the scribes and the Pharisees were both a part. Let's go back for a minute and revisit our traditional view of this widow as an outstanding model of sacrificial giving, the poster child for stewardship. While we are challenged to imitate her generosity, do we also realize that nowhere in the scripture passage does Jesus praise her or her offering? He doesn't claim that we should all follow her example of giving. He doesn't use her offering to deliver a sermon on the virtues of tithing and stewardship. He doesn't deliver a lecture on the importance of supporting church operating budgets. Given how little we know or what we think we know about Jesus, it seems inconceivable that he would hold up this woman as an example of the fairness of a system that seemed to have a preferential option for the wealthy. Inconceivable that he would say that her actions exemplify justice for the poor, or that there is anything commendable about her giving all that she had at the expense of her own well-being. In this case, Jesus didn't say, go and do likewise. Rather, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into it. And then he denounced a system that simply looked the other way when confronted by the injustice of the widow's situation. It is so interesting, isn't it, that this particular scripture comes right at a time when issues of national stewardship are being debated, at a time when we can all pretty much guess who's going to fall or be pushed off the fiscal cliff if Congress and the President can't reach an agreement that honors those who bear the heaviest and most unequal portion of the burden, an agreement that doesn't look away from injustice. How can we not be outraged by the amount of money spent on an election that essentially didn't change a thing? How can we not be distressed by the exorbitant amounts of federal and state money poured into the Pentagon budget for the ongoing militarization of this country? How can we not demand better of our elected officials when it comes to the stewardship of all of our resources, economic, environmental, medical, natural, and the most precious resource of all, our people, especially the most fragile and vulnerable among us? The answer, of course, is that we can't. We can't afford to be silent. We can't afford to be fat, passive. We can't afford the ongoing stalemate in this country. But you know that, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir. Heidi Newmark, whom I quoted earlier, says, if you think about it, Jesus' words might just as easily refer to the unevenness of taxation and sacrifice in our public life. This poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Newmark concludes her commentary with these words. Is Jesus lifting her up as a blessed example or denouncing a system of unholy inequality? I don't think we have to choose. Many of us have been inspired by the outsized generosity of people living in poverty, which in itself becomes a potent refusal to be written off as worthless. Every penny shared, every grain of rice poured into those coffee cans, honors God, loves neighbor, and resists dehumanization. So does the stewardship of our labors to change a system that begets misery. We might see it as two sides to the same coin. In just a few minutes, we will dedicate our financial support to McAllister Plymouth United Church for the coming year. But notice that when we ask for God's blessing on them, we do so not simply as another year's monetary pledge, but as symbols of our love, and our intention to offer ourselves more fully to God, that God's will may be done on earth. As we move into a new season of life together here at the church, may it be so. May it always be so. Amen.